Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Conversations with Cabral. Great to be here with you today. Today's guest expert is going to be someone that you're going to want to tune into through the end, and that is because he is a world-renowned specialist in human behavior. He's a researcher, global educator, literally around the world, and also the author of The Values Factor, which we'll be talking about on today's show. This book was literally written like a workbook that you can begin to discover your highest values and your purpose of what you are meant to be doing in your life. Really fun show. Great to be talking with Dr. Demartini here today. Uh, really a wealth of wisdom, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Take care, everyone. Let us know what you thought in the comments in YouTube, social media, or anywhere where we can connect. Take care. Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Cabral Concept. Great to have you here today. We've got our special guest on Conversations with Cabral, and that is Dr. Demartini. Great to have you here today on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be able to invite you on here today. And the reason is that I just finished up reading your book, The Values Factor, and I have this actually right beside me. You can see all the little dog ears right there. And when I read a book, I really like to absorb it. I like to take in the information and see how I can apply that to my life. And there's some books that I do read where I think that you can use them almost as a workbook. And so I was, I was reading your book. I really enjoyed being able to go through the different chapters, answer the questions, start to figure out kind of where more my my values align? And, and also, am I in alignment with them? Am, am I living the life that I want to be living? So wanted to invite you here on today, have a nice discussion around this particular topic. And then, of course, we can help people work through these value factors as well, and then pick up your book, be able to get to this in more detail. So one place I do want to start is, of course, um, I always love to hear how people got into the field that they got into. And I was especially excited when I read your bio that you actually got into the field potentially, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, because of Dr. Uh, Paul Bragg. Is that correct? I was 17 years old, November 18th, 1972. And I was led from a health food store that I was having juices and sandwiches at to an evening event at a yoga class on the North shore of Oahu where mm -hmm. I was a surfer. And I had no idea that that night was going to have such an impact on my life. And there was 35 people sitting on a wooden floor on towels and mats. A woman Yogi introduced this uh, elderly gentleman and he began to speak and he spoke for under an hour. And that one hour in that one man, that one night, really got to me. And I was a high school dropout at the time. I was living on the North Shore in a tent. And I was a street kid before that. And I was told in first grade I would never be able to read or write, not be able to communicate effectively, never mount anything, never go very far in life because I had speech problems, reading problems, and learning problems. And the night he spoke, <clears throat> the things he said made me believe that maybe I could overcome my learning problems and someday learn how to read and be intelligent. I never thought I was going to be intelligent. I thought I'd be a, a surfer, you know, sports person. Not that sports people are not intelligent. They are in another way, but I never thought I'd be academically smart. And that night I was determined that I would somehow figure a way to overcome that. And I started on a journey to eventually learn how to read I didn't read my first book until I was 18 and it started with a dictionary mm -hmm. and memorizing 30 words a day until my vocabulary was strong enough where I could actually comprehend some words. And it wasn't easy. My mom helped me because I left Hawaii and I went back to Texas and I uh, started on my journey and I had a dream the night I met him to someday be a teacher traveling the world teaching and 48 years plus here I am. 
I never gave up. I'm now getting to do what I dreamed about doing. And what did uh, Dr. Bragg say that inspired you to go on and, and begin to heal your own life and to get back into school? Well, he said that we have a body, we have a mind, and we have a soul. That's his philosophical view. And the mind, the body must be directed by the mind. The mind must be guided by the soul, mm. the authentic self, he called it. And we need to set goals for ourselves, our family, our community, our city, our state, our nation, our world for 100, 120 years. And then what we, you know, think about, what we visualize, what we talk to ourselves about, how we feel about ourselves and the actions we take impact our life and determine our destiny and the, the habits and character that we become. And so I started following what he said. I started thinking about what I wanted. I started visualizing what I wanted. I started talking about what I wanted. I started, you know, whatever would inspire me, I would focus on that. And then I asked, what are the actions I did? I try to do a, a little action every single day towards that objective. And I started building momentum and I started teaching and became, I just learned how to read first. And then I started to share what I was reading with people and didn't matter who'd listen. I just, anybody would listen, I would speak to them and it just kept growing. And by the time I was on to college, um, I'd have sometimes 100, 150 people a day gathered under some trees in a park area. Sometimes it was 12 to 400 people and they would do a Q&A every day. And I would take advantage of every opportunity to go and share. And I would just read all day long once I learned to read. And I'm still to doing that today. I'm still reading every day and still teaching every day. I love That's it. Fantastic. Can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing than what I love doing. That's great. You're, you're living your highest value. So we'll have to, we'll be getting into that for sure. Yes. Definitely doing it. I'm, <laughs> I've delegated everything else away. Anytime mm -hmm. you fill your day with high priority actions, your self worth goes up. Anytime you do it with low priority actions, it goes down. I've delegated everything. I only research, write, and teach today. Everything else is off my plate. I don't drive. I don't cook. I don't do administrative. I don't do any domestic duties. I am useless except for teaching and researching and writing. That's it. That's about all I can do. <laughs> and, and so you're, yeah, you're way on this side of the spectrum. We'll see if we can start to move people in that direction, which would be great. I really, I mean, I would love to have met uh, Dr. Bragg as well. It seems like a lot of the traditional naturopaths that they understood that the body was just one part of it. You know, it's like you can only do so much for the physical body if you're not bringing along the mind as well. And, and I think that's a lot of what you're trying to teach here is because your nervous system, as we talk about on, on my podcast, is so intimately connected with your mind. And if you are always stressed or unhappy or just not living your best life and you know it, you're not aligned, well, then it's going to affect you in the physical body as well. Your psychology is literally going to affect your nervous system. I, I really believe that the physical body, <clears throat> I use the analogy or the example of if the person pigs out and overeats and the next morning they get a headache and a nausea and they get puffy face and they get allergy symptom kind of symptoms and swollen eyes, gas and cramps, stomach ache. Those are all symptoms. So the allopathic approach is get rid of the symptoms. Here's a pill for every one of those symptoms. The chiropractic and naturopathic approach is, okay, when did they begin this morning? What the hell did you do last night? Mm -hmm. I pigged out. Okay, so are the symptoms really disease? Are the symptoms your body's healthy response to a foolish behavior to guide you to live wisely with more temperance? <clears throat> and I've always believed that the symptoms in our body are feedback mechanisms and guiding us to live an authentic, centered life where our biochemistry and neurochemistry come back into balance. And so I'm a, a believer that uh, we don't have a deficiency of drugs or organs you know, deficiency of drugs or an excess of organs, we have a, a maybe non-awareness of how to live. <laughs> yes. And Paul Bragg was, a, you know, he called it the seven doctors when I was 18 or 17 years old. He said, he said, you need a little sunshine. You need some deep breathing of air. You need plenty of water. You need to eat quality, real foods. You need to have a mental attitude that's inspiring. You know, you want to hang out with people that are doing things. You know, there, there's basic things, there are common sense things that we took for granted. You need to exercise and move. And uh, I started incorporating that and my life changed. 
That's great to hear. And yes, but I think common sense is becoming a lot less common as we start to move into a more of a technology based lifestyle and, and more of a, you know, what seems like staring at screens for the majority of the day. So it's good that we are bringing more of that back. And I know you have the chiropractic background and a lot of the uh, people in my field, which would be the natural health based field. It's not just naturopathic doctors or traditional naturopaths or, um, you know, that realm of degree, but a lot of chiropractors, when I was uh, at IFM and learning a lot about functional medicine, a lot of the practitioners there were chiropractors because they have the perfect background with the autonomic nervous system and the understanding of essentially that everything is connected to everything. And if you don't heed, if you don't pay attention to that, well, then it's going to end up as symptoms. And so it is nice to begin to trace these things back to the root cause. And as you said, someone who wakes up with allergies, you know, does not have a Benadryl deficiency. And, uh, and we begin to look at our world that way. Well, we can, I, I had a, I'll share an interesting story here. I had a woman who had anaphylactic shock and had nine different episodes into the hospital with anaphylaxis. If she got anywhere around wheat, I mean, mm. just a, a flake of a wheat roll or flake of wheat in some food, she'd end up in the hospital. Mm. And we, did a little experiment in one of my programs and we found out that when she was a young child about high chair say a stage where you're eating wheat mush mm -hmm. the parents had a massive blow up fight and she associated threat with eating wheat and her way of you might say diffusing the family conflict was getting a reaction it stopped the fighting and and anytime she would eat wheat, her brain was associating this response and she would go into this reaction. Mm. And so we went in there and kind of regressed her back in time to that point and neutralized that with a series of questions to make her conscious of unconscious information to balance it. And redid the association she had with wheat and her normal immune response stopped. And from that day on, she's been able to eat wheat, hadn't had a problem. So a lot of our symptomatology, our feedback mechanisms to guide us back to appreciating and loving our lives and not seeing highly polarized sympathetic or parasympathetically inducing responses. And so I'm, I'm a firm believer that we have amazing capacities inside to transform our physiology once we appreciate that the physiology is trying to help us. <laughs> our signs and symptoms are not the problem. They're actually trying to awaken our solution. We sometimes forget that. We're, we've gotten in such a mode. I mean, you know, uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, the germ theory, Cook's postulates, right, and Fleming's ideas and stuff, the idea was these are bad little entities. They're evil. I remember 44 years ago, I was lecturing on the benefits of microorganisms and microbiomes 44 years ago. And I got laughed at in professional school. What kind of craziness is this? And I said, listen, there are beneficial uh, more microorganisms that we require for decomposing foods and to help our immune system and our nervous system. And nobody was thinking about all that along that line. Now it's a common thing, but they thought that microorganisms were bad and our immune system was there to attack and protect. Today, they now know that the immune system is a sensory organ <clears throat> giving feedback to the ratios of microorganisms to help us regulate the microbiome to help have a maintained ecosystem, an internal ecosystem. And so our mindset has shifted from bad to balance. And that's a huge uh, step. But that's what naturopaths and I think chiropractors have already been acknowledging. But now I think in mainstream uh, allopathic approaches, that's starting to awaken. And great, because I think that, uh, you know, what you eat has an impact on the microbiome. What you think has an impact on the microbiome. Your microbiome has an impact on what you think and eat. They work as a reciprocal relationship. And a wise, integrative, holistic viewer will see all those things and put the, the concept together and educate the client as a teacher. Yeah, that's very well said. And and we had uh, Mark Wolin and a number of um, 
psychotherapists on, hypnotherapists as well, sharing the exact same sentiments that a lot of times trapped inside of our cells, which we could also say is part of our nervous system, trapped inside of that and in, in terms of our uh, psychophysiological being are the memories from the past, maybe even past generations as well that were passed on through epigenetics. So I find it a very fascinating field and, and the number of uh, reports that people have had with this type of work, I think is fantastic. And of course, we see it work in things like neuro-linguistic programming that I've spoken about before, hypnotherapy and certain types of psychotherapy therapy. So yeah, I think that without a doubt, you know, we have to look at this, this mindset as a big part of our physical healing as well. So I'd love now to start to switch to, uh, you know, and I wouldn't even say, so we're, we're going to talk about what's a little bit of the uh, essence of the values factor, but really what I want to talk about is that why should we have values in the first place? Like, how does that, how does that even allow us to live a better life? Because if we're asking people to start to think more about their internal beliefs and self-awareness and who they believe they really are and what they should be moving towards, what will that ultimately allow them to achieve? And then hopefully we can kind of start from the beginning and then work towards that. Okay. So I, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole a bit. <clears throat> Let's say you're walking down the street and you meet somebody and you misinterpret them and put them on a pedestal and assume that they're either smarter than you or more successful than you or more wealthy than you or have a more stable relationship than you or more socially connected than you or more physically fit than you or more spiritually aware than you. And you put them on a pedestal and in turn, in comparison, you put yourself in a pit. You minimize yourself and exaggerate them and feel a little intimidated by them compared to you. And therefore, you're too humble to admit what you see in them inside you. And you kind of devalue you and overvalue them. Or you walk down the, the street and you meet somebody that you do just the opposite. You look down on and you think they're less intelligent, less successful, less financially viable, etc. And then you exaggerate you and you puff yourself up. So anytime you look up to somebody or look down on somebody, you'll minimize yourself or exaggerate yourself. And when you're exaggerating or minimizing yourself, you're not being yourself. And the reason you're exaggerating and minimizing is you're too proud or too humble to admit what you see in them inside you. Mm -hmm. And anytime you do, because you're too proud or too humble to admit it, that's a disowned part. And these disowned parts are voids that want filling. So when we are, because what we have is a homeostatic mechanism in the brain trying to get us objective and neutral and in a state of equanimity and authenticity. Because when we exaggerate ourselves or minimize ourselves with pride or shame, we're not being ourselves. We're puffing ourselves up with personas and masks and facades of an exaggerated or minimized self instead of being ourselves. And there's an innate homeostatic mechanism to be ourselves. We want to be loved for who we are. We want There's a homeostatic mechanism in, at all scales in our physiology and psychology. So we're striving for that authenticity. So whenever we perturb it by these disowned parts, they create voids that want filled. And fulfillment is filling those voids. And our values emerge as a result of those voids. And our values to be filled is to eventually own those parts, as Plato described. And so we are when we have a hierarchy of values, that's because things that are most missing become more important and things that are less missing become less important. There's a hierarchy there and it's all perceptual as a, as a, when I was in Nepal, I met with the Bumpa Lama and we had a discussion about the idea that nothing is actually missing, but in our reality, things appear to be missing because of our judgments. And Pedicle said that there was love and strife. When we actually see the fullness and nothing missing, we have the fullness of love, a, a Gnostic pleroma as they called it. But the second we're down in the terrestrial world judging things, we start to exaggerate or minimize ourselves, we end up having internal strife. And this is, in a sense, the survival amygdala response. Avoid pain, seek pleasure, you know, seek prey, avoid predator kind of thing. And in the process of doing that, as long as we're in that amygdala and we're in that judgment phase and we're having these voids, we're having incompletions, we're having unfulfillments, and we have a yearning innately to fill those and so we're led on our path to fill those voids in our life that we started from that we judged mm. to eventually get us to a point where we realize that we're worthy of love. And so are the things around us. Schopenhauer says that we become our true self to the degree that we make everyone else ourselves. 
But anything we're too proud or too humble to admit that we see in others inside us, we're disowning. And any disflection, any disownment, any disempowerment from that is the part of us that creates the symptoms epigenetically. Because when we infatuate with somebody, that's a parasympathetic stimulus. When we resent somebody, that's a, a sympathetic stimulus. Mm-hmm. And both of those epigenetically are altering physiology and creating psychological hormonal imbalances to let us know that we have a skewed view of our reality and we're not owning what we're seeing and having reflective awareness and present. But the moment we have our highest value, which is the most objective, the most balanced and neutral, the higher the probability we neutralize those judgments and start to have fulfillment. So filling our day with the highest priority actions that inspire us is the most powerful way to not have low priority distractions keep running our lives. And we bring our about healing. If we live by our highest values, we're more resilient, more adaptable, more expanded, more likely to walk our talk, more empowered and more self-worth. And we have our, our immune system and our heart rate variability expands. Our resilience goes up. I could go on and on and on about the significance of living congruently by what is really most important to your life. It fills the voids that we have in life and transcends the judgments that keep us in bondage. That was really well said. And and I've believed for a long time that part of my healing process since I was sick, essentially around the same age at 17 years old, and it took until 27 to get fully well. But a lot of that and what I teach today was a lot of through Eastern based philosophy and just, you know, the religious philosophies, if you, if you kind of, if you kind of look for similar threads throughout all of them, they're, they have some very similar teachings. And one of them is that, you know, you should not judge or lest you be judged. And, but the judgment comes from yourself. That's the amazing thing is that when I used to judge other people, meaning like, just as you said, I was better than or less than this person had more or less than I had and whatever it might be, you know, relationships, spirituality, finances, body, whatever, is that I saw then the lack in myself, or as you said, the, the proudness, whatever, through the ego, which then only caused more judgment in, in light later in life. But it also, it's, it's a vicious cycle because you start to judge everything. And, and that becomes, it's like a, it's like a checklist. It's a scorecard, a scoreboard of how you're doing in life. Whereas if you stop judging, it's amazing though. The biggest thing I found is this, is I wasn't worried then anymore about what anybody else was saying about me because I wasn't saying anything about anybody else. So I never thought that anybody else would be saying anything about me. And so it's kind of funny in that way. I was like, I relieved judgment around myself by no longer judging other. And it's one of the best things I've ever been able to do. Now, again, I'm not perfect, but I've got well, maybe, maybe you are for all of the traits. I, I went through the Oxford Dictionary. I'm a neurotic guy. I went to the Oxford yeah. Dictionary 36 years ago and went page by page by page, this giant dictionary, thin paper, small print dictionary. And anywhere I saw a human behavioral trait, I, I underlined or circled. Mm-hmm. I found 4,628 traits in that dictionary. And then I thought of who do I know that represents that trait to the fullest expression? And I put their initial out there. And then I looked at my life and I said, all right, John, go to a moment where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating that particular trait in action that I admire or despise, where do I own it? And I started making a list until I could see where I've done it to the same degree as I saw in the most extreme examples I met. And I went through and owned all 4,628 traits. took me months. And then I realized that any trait I disown is a button that I'm walking around with that people are going to push. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about what people do. I found out that I only resented people that reminded me of something I had done that I feel ashamed of. And I only admired people that is that they reminded me of something that I was too humble to admit, but I had that I admired in myself. And once I realized that, I realized that if I can go and own all those and find the downsides, the ones I'm proud of and the upsides, the ones I'm you know, resenting in myself or ashamed about, I don't have to walk around with pride and shame. And until you can govern yourself, you can't master your life. Mm -hmm. Until you can realize you're a hero and a villain, a saint and a sinner, a virtue and a vice, and you transcend those moral hypocrisies that are being imposed on us by institutional, you know, insight. The moment you transcend that, you're free to be yourself. Everybody wants to be loved for who they are. And when they're uniquely who they are, they make the biggest difference in the world. And they give permission and exemplification of what's possible for all human beings. And the liberty of that is freeing. And it magnetizes other people to you because people want that. 
Yes. And so you end up magnetizing people, places, things, ideas, and events into your life that are synchronous to your innermost dominant thought. And it now becomes your outermost tangible reality. You manifest in your life the things that you're actually intending because you're not distracted, subordinating to outside authorities or subordinating, trying to push people around. You trying to get others to live in your values or you try to live in other people's values is futile. But you loving these people and honoring them and communicating what you value most in terms of what they value most is liberating. Mm, that's great. So how, how do, cause we're talking about values and I'm not sure that everyone listening right now understands what their values are or even should be. So can you explain broad definition of values and then how can we go about figuring out being more self-aware as to what our values are and I would say a third part to that, because we'll make this question very complicated, are they built in from childhood or are we, are, are we allowed to recreate new ones as adults? Okay, first of all, the values, we're, we, values are found in single-celled organisms. A single-celled organism will have an endocytosis and open up to a food substance. Mm -hmm. And exocytosis and get rid of a waste product. So it automatically is seeking and avoiding pleasure and pain, sweet and bitter. Mm -hmm. You know, we look for sugar, we avoid bitter alkaloids kind of thing. So that is a primitive void value axis of judgment and morality right there. So morality doesn't come from the gods. It comes from human beings living in their amygdala in survival, projecting onto other people those values that they happen to be living. So... There are social values of mothers, fathers, preachers, teachers, small peer groups, larger peer groups until we get to city, state, nation, and world. But as Kohlberg says, the highest level of moral is transcendence, to transcend all of those people's value systems and allow yourself to express what's true for you. Very few people have done that. Most people live subordinating to traditions, conventions, and the way they think they're supposed to be, and they never get past their own family or their community's belief systems or their traditions of possibly religion or philosophies that they've subordinated to. To actually be an independent thinker, an unborrowed vision, as Ian Rand describes, is very rare. But those that do, they're the ones that leave their mark. They're the misfits, as Steve Jobs said. They're the square pegs and the round holes, as they say. You have a set of values, and to the degree of the uniqueness of that, uh, you will probably get ridiculed, violently opposed until you become self-evident. You're either following a culture, subordinating to a tradition, or you're building a new culture, initiating a new tradition. I would much rather initiate one than be stagnant, subordinating, because evolution requires somebody being the, dis the different, the one that stands out and goes with a different pathway. Otherwise, we're just stuck. Now, how do you determine your values? I've been asking that for 43 plus years now. I've been working with values for almost 43 and a half years. And I developed a methodology that to help people discern it. Because if you ask somebody their values, they're going to tell you social idealisms. They're going to tell you what the society expects. Honesty, integrity, truth, peace, and all this other stuff. I don't go by that. I go by what your life demonstrates. I'm only interested in what your life demonstrates. I'm not interested in what you say. I'm not interested in what you expect the world to think it should be. Anytime you hear I should, I ought to, I suppose to, I got to, I have to, I must, I need to, the imperatives, mm -hmm. you know you've injected somebody else's values. It's not yours. You don't ever should yourself. You only should yourself when you're comparing your actions to somebody else's values that you've given more power to because you've got them on a pedestal and you minimize yourself to them. So what I do is I look at how people fill their space because something that's really, really, really important and they keep around them in their intimate and personal space within four feet of them and something that's not important, they discard. They don't want it around. You can see this in babies. You can see it in, in animals. You can see it in humans, in adults. Then I look at how they spend their time. They find time, make time, and spend time on things that are really valuable to them. They figure out a way of getting the time on it. Then I look at what is energizing to them. Because if they grow in energy when they're around it, it's important to them. If not, it drains them. So if I get to teach, I'm inspired. I can go all day long on it. But you ask me to cook or drive, I haven't driven in 32 years. And I haven't cooked since I was 24. I've delegated. I learned a long time ago, unless you delegate lower priority things, don't expect an inspired life. Don't do low priority things in your life. Not the way to live. So you look at what energizes you. The next one is what do you spend your money on? You find money, make money, spend money on things that are valuable to you. You run out of money on things that don't. 
So tell me what your disbursements are in your finances and I'll tell you what you value. If it's, if it's a house, then you value whatever that represents to you. If it's uh, travel, then you do that. If it's clothes, if it's health, if it's education, look at what you're spending your money on and you'll see that there's a reiteration of how you fill your space, your time, what you energize yourself by and the money you spend. There'll be a pattern and it'll reiterate if you're honest with the answers. Then you look at where you're most organized. Then you look at where you're most disciplined. What do you spontaneously do that nobody has to remind you to do? You don't want to have to ever be extrinsically motivated to do it. What is that? Mine is teaching and, and uh, reading. I read every day and I teach every day. Then you look at what is it you think about, what do you visualize, and what do you internally dialogue with yourself about, about how you really want your life to be that shows evidence of coming true. If there's no evidence, it's fantasy. If it's not what you want, then you're basically self-depreciating. I want to know what is it you visualize, think about, and affirm about how you really, really want your life to be that is evidence showing. Then I look at what you want to converse with other people about most. You keep wanting to bring the conversation to. How's your golf game? How's your investments? How's your family? How's your health? What do you want to talk about most? Then I look at what it brings tears of inspiration to you when you're doing it. And what's common to the people that inspire you most? What's the pattern? You'll see a same reiterating pattern showing up in all 13 of these questions I'm, I'm asking. Then I look at what it is that's the most consistent, persistent goals that you've been focusing on that you do not stop on and you keep persevering on it and you're showing evidence and manifestation of your intention. And then I look at what do you spend, what do you can't wait to study, read about, learn about, and watch on YouTube? What do you spontaneously want to learn? Because what's high in your value, you want to absorb, it's like you want to eat it, you want to consume it as far as knowledge. If I answer three answers for each of those and answer them, you'll see the same answers repeat. And the ones that show up most frequent is the higher value, second most frequent, second highest value. And you can literally create a hierarchy of values based on what your life is demonstrating, not the fantasies you're holding and not the expectations that you think you're subordinating to in society. Because those are not how to set your goals. You want to set goals that are congruent with what you spontaneously do. So you spontaneously take action and don't require any form of extrinsic motivation, reward or punishment to get you to act. That is a way more inspiring life than extrinsically motivation. If you need to be reminded to do what you say is important, what you say is important is not important. Yeah, and it's, it's good to differentiate that because, you know, it's not important to you. It might be important to someone else as part of their value system, but it's simply not as part of the hierarchy of your value system. And one of the people that I've gone back to a few times, and there, there are obviously different people that we can quote, but uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, you know, it's really difficult to focus on enlightenment, enlightenment or transcendence at the very top when you haven't first worked through your basic needs. Like if you can't pay your rent, if you can't put food on the table for your family, it's, you know, it's difficult to move there. So at least in my mind, it's saying like, okay, these are my values. This is my, my highest good that I want to be serving and working with. I need to get to that top part as fast as I can. You know, it's like, you probably didn't get to delegate everything at 17, 18 years old, but you knew that in order for you to live your best life and, and really live your highest values, you needed to delegate everything so that you could spend all of your allocated time for work or, or life essentially within your kind of your zone of genius, right? It's your teaching and reading. You read something and then you want to teach it. You know, I'm a lot the same way. It's like, oh, this is unbelievable. And I see things in a different way and I can't wait to then do a podcast podcast about it or, or video, whatever it might be. So how do people get there? Is it, is there a, a specific steps that they need to go through or do they simply start to think more about how they can live within these values or, or is there more of a concrete path? Oh, I, I found a, at 27, I opened up my practice and I had one assistant that I hired and I was doing just about everything. Mm. And some of the things that I was in school for I wasn't doing those only. I was doing all this trivial stuff that I didn't want to do. And it was a bit draining. And I was spending long hours. And so I went to a bookstore, Walden's bookstore in those days, which is a chain. And I found this book called The Time Trap by Alec McKenzie. And I sat and read it, underlined it, circled it, dog-eared it, just like your, yourself. We have a lot in common, I think. And what happened is <clears throat> I then summarized it into a little format and maybe as I say this just now, if anybody's listening, and you want to, you might want to get a piece of paper out and create this because this was a gold mine. I took a piece of paper and I, I drew five vertical lines on it. So I had six equal space columns. In the first column, I wrote down every single thing that I did in a day. 
personal, professional, not vague generalities like marketing or something. I went through the actual action steps that I did in a day and broke them down into nitpicky little action steps moment by moment through the day. Over a three month period, I thought of every action I might do on a Monday, a Sunday or whatever. And I listed every single thing that I do in a day to be honest and reflective and introspective on what am I actually doing with my time? Did your time's your life? And I made a list of that. That was the first step. In the second column, I wrote down, how much does it produce? How much income does it produce per hour? And I found out that at least 80% of what I was doing wasn't making any money. And I was sitting there doing stuff that was majoring in minors and mining in majors and doing a lot of stuff that wasn't producing. And I, I saw that if I made an income, that meant I was serving somebody. And so part of fulfillment in life is the service. You know, it's not about just reward and narcissistic. It's also about giving and serving. And you, you, if you do service without reward or reward without service, it doesn't feel complete. It's an incomplete transaction. So I wrote down what it produced per hour. And then I hierarchically organized that by priority because the thing that was the most productive thing for me when I really looked at it, which surprised me, was going out and speaking in front of groups of people and engaging them in wanting to come in to get care. Hmm. And the second most important thing was actually clinically going into the cubicle and actually delivering that care. And then it went down from there. And then I, I went, whoa, I went for 10 years of college to go and do something. And the thing that's actually most important is actually getting out and bringing your message. Those are the mission, have a message to the world and inspiring people. So I, once I saw that, I said, OK, we're going radio, television, we're going out and we're, we're spreading the word and speaking engagements. But when I prioritized that, that was an eye opener. And then I realized I was spending 80 percent of my time doing something that wasn't really producing. Some of it wasn't even making any money at all. Then the next column, I wrote down, how much meaning does it have? Now, this is where, that's the narcissistic side. How much meaning and inspiration do I get out of doing all those things? And I wrote those down and I was quite surprised because luckily, a great number of the ones that produced were also the most meaningful to me. Speaking, educating, and doing the clinical work was inspiring to me. Administrative, supplies, you know, paperwork, financial stuff, that was not my thing. Luckily, those were not the highest producers, so and the not least meaning. So I wrote down all the meaning, and then I prioritized that list, and then I looked at the priority of the meaning and the production, and I prioritized the summary. Then I went to the next column, and I said, if I was to delegate these things, how much would it cost me? Every cost, not just a salary, training cost, uh, you know, occupancy of, of uh, office space, equipment, desks, uh, training, anything, insurance, anything, parking. I went down to down to the paperclip. What would it cost me to get somebody to delegate that to do a standard greater than my standard? Somebody who did it greater than I did. And I looked at the cost and then I looked at the spreads between the income versus the cost. And I prioritized the spread. In the next column, I looked at how much time is actually spent on those actions on a daily basis, average. And then on the final column, I reprioritized the entire list according to all the variables. And then I layered that into 10 layers. And then I hired somebody on the bottom layer of the lowest layer and hired somebody. It took three people to get the person to be freed that. Hired the next person, hired the next person. And in 18 months from starting out in my practice in a 987 square foot little place with one assistant, 18 months later, I had a 5,000 square foot place and five doctors and 12 staff members. And I was speaking and doing only the clinical work on the most advanced, impactful people. And I was making 10 times the amount of income. And I delegated the rest of it. And I never turned back. I never went back to doing any of those things ever again. And since I was 27, 28 years old, stopped it. That was it. Done. I learned not to do low priority things. But that meant that I had to be accountable to dedicate my life to being of service, doing what I love doing. Because if you're not getting remunerated for doing what you love, you're going to have a Monday morning blue, a Wednesday hump days, a thank God it's Friday, a week freaking end. And that's how you make yourself sick. Getting up and not being inspired by what you do and then having to escape it with a, a, a you know, a break, a, a vacation or in a, a, some sort of retirement. I don't have a desire for a break or a vacation retirement. My life is a vacation. <laughs> My life is a vacation. I'm doing what I love every day. So it's, it's inspiring. But prioritizing like that liberates people 
and it makes them accountable to do something that they would absolutely tap dance, tap dance to go to work to go and do on a daily basis that serves people that gets compensated with sustainable fair exchange that liberates people from the crazies in their lives. Yeah. And uh, I've said from the beginning that I get to do something for a career and for a life and, and from a young age that I would typically pay to do. Meaning, and I have, I mean, I paid for internships. Uh, some of them were actually, I had to pay to be in this, this particular internship, but I, but at the same time that I was working in these clinics at the same time while being paid, uh, while paying for them to, for me to help other people. But the truth is that once you know what it is and how you want to serve, because really it is about service, uh, you get so much out of that as well. Meaning you might get as much of, it, of, uh, meaning in your life as you're giving to someone else's. And that's how I've looked at it. And I had the same realization. I, I had multiple very large practices until 2018. And we, we saw 20,000 appointments a year. So probably again, similar to, to the practices you are running. And I loved it. And I was, I was, you know, there for 40 hours a week in terms of appointments, but I had another 40 hours a week at, on my other job. And my other job was running these massive practices. And even though I had managing directors, like a general manager, there was still so many people and, and so much uh, paperwork and everything else to deal with that that was no longer enjoyable or fun, but it allowed me to do what I was doing. And then I realized, well, what if, again, there was, what if, what if it was unlimited? What if I could reach uh, millions of people all over the world virtually? And that's really when things began to open up for me because I realized for me that the ego side of me wanted the physical practice, but my higher self wanted to teach. And if I was able to teach without the physical practice, well, I'd get everything really that I wanted because I didn't need the ego part of it. So, you know, it's funny how that lines up. And, and for me, it's always been, um, you know, I, I might be able to read these things, but I need to live it in order to feel it. And then, you know, get that, I would say, um, uh, get that reinforcement from it. Like, okay, you're on the, on the right path. So I think people will know too, as they're beginning to live more of their higher self, just like you said, you can have more energy. I always had energy. You can't wear me out when I'm speaking or teaching or in a consultation, but 10 minutes into doing spreadsheets with an accountant. And I'm like, you know, there's gotta be a better way for me to spend. No, I delegate. Don't, I always say, don't, <laughs> don't waste your life on low priority actions. If you're, if you're doing anything other than what inspires you, you don't expect an inspired life. It's that simple. And I would say the other way, like that's someone else's inspired life. Yeah. So like my, the accountants that I work with that, they love it. And so that's the thing is like when you are delegating where you're allowing someone else to live their higher values that's it. and you're, you're making a job essentially for them. And so when you have these practices, whether it's virtual or in person and you're delegating where well, you're delegating things that you don't want to do, but someone else does like that's their enjoyment. And so that's what I've learned as well is that you know, you're, you're not, not giving meaningless work to other people. It's meaningless to you. Someone else derives great meaning from it. No, you're getting them. This is a path of self-actualization because, and that's why it's important to screen people that you're hiring to make sure you know their values, to know that you're delegating and allocating uh, the responsibilities to them that match what their values are. Because yes. if they do, they can't wait to get up and do the exercise and you don't have to micromanage them. You're liberated. That's, that's excellent. Yeah. So let's talk though. I want to, I want to really start to pull this together for people. So first I'm assuming we need to realize just as you just said, what gives you more energy in life? What, you know, it builds you up. What are you inspired by? What do you keep around you? What are your thoughts typically on? What videos do you search out that you talked about? Then what are some of the first steps that we can begin to get more of that in our life? For you, it took 18 months to begin to delegate a lot of these things. For me, it, I would say it definitely took longer. So, and there's a lot in between, there's a learning process that needs to take place. So, and that is what we call life, right? So how do we start to get moving on that path though? Well, you, you first realize that everybody around you is projecting their values onto you and you're going to be bombarded by everybody else's expectations to do what they think is important. Mm -hmm. And you have to have an immunity, it might say from that and say, thank you, but no, thank you. I have my own values and be able to say no to expectations and you might say opportunist and people that are up to distracting your time. You have to be able to say no to low priority things and say only yes to the highest priority thing if you want to master this game. But then you want to ask yourself, what is the highest priority action I can do today that can serve the greatest number of people 
And how do I do it in the most efficient and effective manner with the resources I have? Mm -hmm. And how do I do it in such a way that I'm inspired to do it spontaneously? If you ask those questions every day and stick to the highest priority things, amazing things start to happen. It's, it's sticking to finding that one thing that you love doing and giving yourself permission to do it. And no, it's not going to happen necessarily in one day. It may take weeks or months or years to finally liberate yourself from all the things you, did, you can delegate. But if you don't go down that path, you're going to live a quiet life of desperation, not a life of inspiration. It's that simple. There's no alternative <laughs> that's going to give you meaning and fulfillment. It, it, the meaning and fulfillment in your life is based on what the highest value is. And that's the one where you're most objective and you're most inspired and most neutral and resilient and adaptable to whatever happens. When you're doing something you love doing at the end of the day, if you did your highest priority things, you come home, you can handle whatever happens. If you end up putting fires out all your day, doing low priority stuff, and you never got around to what was important, you're a bear when you come home. And you're going to create symptoms in your physiology and psychology and family to let you know that. And that's just feedback from the universe to let you know you weren't authentic today. Wake up. Get back to priority. Everything's trying to get you to top priority. I love that. And I say the same thing is that people just need to carve out, even if it's a half hour before the rest of their family wakes up, maybe a half hour at lunch, a half hour before bed. But if you get a little time of you, then you can feel better about giving your time to all the other people out there that you serve, whether it's your kids or your partner or whoever it might be. But if I don't get just a little bit of time for myself in the morning, even if it means waking up a little bit earlier, I'm just not the best father that I can be, the best husband, the best you know um, leader of their team, whatever it may be. So it doesn't, maybe it's not the person's entire life, but you need to take back a little bit of the life that you want to be leading. And as you just said, you know, the time's going to pass anyway. So like, that's the thing is like, you're going to be more upset about not having to at least try to go for it and not be perfect, but at least go for it because a year from now, well, another year's passed and it's one more year without you starting to live a lot of these values that you want in your life. Yeah. I, I, I don't, um, I always say that the majority of people are running by their amygdala, trying to avoid predator and seek prey. And they're looking for a monopole. And, and um, you know, the Buddha says the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is a source of human suffering. Mm. And so I don't look for a one-sided world. I don't look for, you know, to be nice, never mean, kind, never cruel, positive, never negative. I'm, I'm, a one, I'm not a one-sided guy. If I'm honest with myself, if you support my values, I'm a nice pussycat. You challenge my values, I'll be a tiger. You know, I can be kind and cruel and nice and mean and positive, negative and, and open and closed and, and, and honest and dishonest. I've been all the above if I'm really honest with myself and look objectively. So the perfection is all the above. It's not one-sidedness. And if we're searching for a one-sided outcome, we're going to think, well, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're never, you know, who's perfect? But the perfection is the, uh, is the honoring of the fullness of our lives. And most people don't get that. They, they, they're holding on to a hypocritical mor morality of one-sidedness that they can't live by and beat themselves up and then beat everybody else up and then think the world's screwed up. The world's magnificent. <laughs> I, have a, I think the world's magnificent. I'm doing quite, I, I feel like it's, I'm getting everything that I want in life. I'm, I, I set out when I was 18 years old to become, wake up my genius and, and, and grow an international global business and become financially independent and have a global family dynamic. And I live on a, on a, on a big ship that goes around the world called the world. That's I've been living on for 20 years. I am socially influential, physically vital and energized and inspired. I'm absolutely certain that's doable on this planet. And I don't see anything stopping me from that, except my perceptions, my decisions and my actions, which I have control of. Yes. And I think I, I can't remember the exact quote in your book, but I know it's something about, that it's uh, removing fantasy and celebrating reality. Meaning like, and, and we have different realities. Our reality that we're currently at right now is our present reality. However, we can move towards something greater in life uh, that we can enjoy that much more. But there is one more part that I, wa I want to get to, and I, I want to start to uh, move this into pulling it together, is that you're probably not going to achieve any of it if you're not living from a place of abundance and gratitude. And I would love to hear your perspective on that because sometimes it's like, well, if I just keep doing this and I keep pushing through this, and if, if this person didn't take this from me, I would have been able to do this. Uh, it's never going to, it's always about competition and it's never just about you. And so I'd love to hear about your perspective on there, there is no lack, that there is an abundance. And, and also we might get there faster if we have a particular gratitude, even if our life isn't where we want it to be right now? 
Well, gratitude is the key that opens up the gateway of the heart and inside the heart's love. And love comes radiating out, window washing the mind and bringing inspiration to the mind and enthusiasm to the body and brings more certainty and presence to our experience. I think that's the key. I was born on Thanksgiving Day. My One of my books is Count Your Blessings. My mother told me if I count my blessings every night and I'm grateful for what I have, I get more to be grateful for. Mm. I believe that when you're living authentically according to your own highest values, you see things on the way, not in the way, and you're grateful for what happens because you know that it has nothing to do with what happens. It's your perception of it. And you have the ability to ask, how is whatever I'm experiencing in my current reality helping me fulfill my mission? And if you answer that question, nothing's in the way. It's all perception. And at the same time, if you prioritize your actions and prioritize your perceptions to what you value most, life is momentum building. And it's very empowering. And there's a lot to be grateful for. And you actually exemplify that to other people. And then that draws opportunities, which makes a perpetual motion of more gratitude. So I can't think of anything else. I mean, I have the largest collection of gratitudes in 30 volumes, 30 giant volumes. If I could show it to you, they're they're big volumes. 30 of those volumes of daily gratitudes, 10 point one inch margins of gratitudes every single day, including this podcast, which I typed right before we came on of the opportunity to be able to be interviewed by yourself and be able to do that and make a difference in some people I don't normally get to reach. So I document those every day because when you're grateful for what you get, you get more to be grateful for. And if you document it, you get tears of gratitude at the end of the night. And I think that's the way to go to bed. And that's the way to wake up in the morning. That's amazing. It's absolutely fantastic to anchor your day that way. If you can go to bed thinking about what you're grateful for and and wake up the same way that it puts your life in perspective as well. It's like, yeah, sure. Not everything may be perfect. However, probably not everything is supposed to be perfect. It's supposed to be, you know, your life. It's a journey. You're overcoming obstacles. You're growing as a human being. And, and there is so much to be grateful for, especially I found that the more that I focus on gratitude, the more I realize there's a lot for me to be grateful about. And that, that, that is the perfection, but that is the perfection. The yes. challenges that you have is testing your own reality because I, you know, we have events in our life we think are terrible. And then a day, a week, a month, a year, or five years later, we look back and go, thank God that occurred. Well, why have the wisdom of the ages with the aging process? We can have the wisdom of the ages right now by asking how specifically is what's happening right now, helping me fulfill my mission. If we answer that question, we don't have to have the entropic aging process And all the idea that, well, that was a mess up and then store that in our subconscious mind and have this reverberating fear of something like that happening again and run all our lives that way. I stop right there in the moment and say, okay, how's this serving me? How's it getting me where I want to go? And I find an answer every time and it liberates me. And so I don't have to go to bed storing that as some avoidance mechanism. I can go in there and say, thank you. And anything we can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything we can say thank you for is fuel. I like that. Yeah, without a doubt. And it's just, it's a different way of looking at life um, and and obviously a much more positive way. So I'd love for you, anything that I, any other tips that you would love to give from your book, The Values Factor, The Secret to Creating an Inspired and Fulfilling Life? Uh, I'll definitely be linking this up in the show notes. I will link up your website, uh, the events where you speak all over the world, and uh, and then of course, social media, et cetera. But um, I'm going to have you uh, give a few of those out in just a moment, but I would love to hear right now, what what are some other parting words of wisdom that you can give people to living a more authentic life, to living the life that they know they were meant to live? Well, I, I break life into seven areas. Our mind development, our, our me- a qu- mental quest for great wisdom, genius, and understanding and creativity. Our vocational quest to do something of service that we get remunerated for in business our financial independence, so we're not a slave to money, we have it working for us, our love and intimacy, our social leadership and influence and making a difference, our physical vitality and immortal expression in our physical form, and our inspired quest, uh, our spiritual mission, you might say. I'm a firm believer that all of them can be enhanced. So I always say, whatever you want to learn, regardless of what it is, ask yourself, how is learning this topic helping me fulfill what's most valuable? And the pulvinar nuclei will filter out information more effectively and efficiently at gathering information and store and retain it and actually be applied more effectively once you see it on the way to what you want. We've all read things that put us to sleep and and sometimes we don't want to go to sleep. When we're reading something that's highly engaging, that's helping us fulfill our highest values, we don't want to go to sleep. But if we're not, we do. So asking how specifically whatever you're learning is helping you fulfill your values will catalyze an accelerated learning process. 
And then if you take your job and you ask yourself, okay, make a list of my job description. Anything in that job description is boring, unfulfilling. That's because of your perception. It's not because of the job. Ask yourself, how is doing this job temporarily until I can either delegate it or go on to the next job? How is it helping me fulfill my mission? What I feel I'm dedicated to. And answer that question. If you answer the question, that same job now is fuel, not friction. And then in the relationship to money, if you don't have a value on wealth building, it, your hierarchy of values is going to dictate how you your financial destiny. If you have a higher value on buying Jimmy Choo shoes and you do buying assets, you're going to keep a, a closet full of shoes that will depreciate. So you have to look at what your values are. And anytime you expect your life financially to be anything but what your values are, you're going to frustrate yourself. So find out where your values are. Find out what's really valuable to you. And you may re- elevate the values by stacking up general benefits of building wealth in your life and buying assets. If you buy assets that work for you, eventually become a master and not a slave to money. And then it buys you those things and you crescendo in your life. And in relationships, whatever it is that you're with and a partner, they have a set of values and their highest value is their identity. If you can ask how specific is what they're committed to, what they're dedicated to, what's inspiring and meaningful to them is helping you fulfill what's meaningful to you. You won't need to fix them and change them. You'll be able to love them for who they are because they're helping you get what you want. When you do, when you love them for who they are, they turn into who you love. And in social leadership, if you live authentically according to what you value most and you're most congruent on it, you're going to wake up a leadership because you're going to exemplify what other people are searching for. And by doing it, you'll end up finding that one thing that you're great at and lead at, and you'll then magnetize people to follow that. And in your physical body, if you live by your highest values and you're most objective and most neutral, the least amount of psychological distresses that lead to the illnesses to have to get you back to authenticity. And if you're living by your highest values, that's where you're inspired, spontaneously inspired. So if you're doing that, you're going to live an inspired life. So that's why I spend so much time on the values factor, because out of all the 48 years of study, that's been a very crucial component of self-actualized pathway to live congruently according to values. If we don't fill our day with high priority actions that inspire us, our day is designed to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. If we don't fill our day with challenges that inspire us, that serve people, our day fills up with challenges we don't want. So I'm here to try to give them that. And on my website, there's a on drdmartini.com, there's a complimentary free value determination process that's complimentary, that's, that's private. No one will see. It'll take them 30 minutes of their time. It'll be well worth the time spent if they can go on there. Just, just go on there, log on, and do the value determination process so you can start to structure your life accordingly. That's excellent. And what's the name of that website again? DrDmartini.com. D-R-D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. DrDmartini.com. Excellent. Well, this has absolutely been a very inspiring conversation. Amazing words of wisdom here. Where can people connect with you on social media as well? Uh, they can go probably just to drdmartini.com. All my social links are there. Okay. Or they can go on to YouTube channel, Dmartini YouTube or Facebook or whatever. You, you, my name's on there about, I think, 30 million places. So you can, you can find it somewhere if you look. Good, for sure. We will absolutely link all of that up here today uh, in the show notes. Thank you so much again for joining us here today. Appreciate Thank you. all of your time. Great questions. And I love it. I think we have a camaraderie of common denominators in our lives. So it's great. I would say so. Thanks again. Take care. We'll talk with you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for just tuning into the show. And as a valued listener, before you go, I want to make sure you are one of the first to know of what is going on right now over at Equa.life. We are giving away one of our most popular products for reducing stress, calming the central nervous system, maintaining healthy hair, skin, and nails, changing carbohydrates into usable fuel and energy, and also improving the overall absorption of your B vitamins. B vitamins are absolutely needed for so many of the different functions in your body that go on with the brain, the nervous system, and the regeneration of our cells of our body. So what we do is we make sure, yes, that we provide that B complex in our daily nutritional support. But for many people who need a boost in energy or need to really fight that aging-based process or calm the stress in central nervous system, this is absolutely the product for them. It's also really easy to use. You can use your daily nutritional support shake in the morning, and you can take one activated B complex at lunch and another at dinner and you are done for all day energy. This is also a full B complex which means it includes 
thiamine and riboflavin and niacin and vitamin B6, folate, B12, biotin, pentothenic acid, choline, which is so great for the brain. And then it has all of the methyl donors and inositol as well. So again, this is a full B complex with all of the methylated B vitamins, of course, because that is exactly what the human body looks like and that is what it's able to absorb. So right now we are giving away about 500 bottles. So we're giving away a lot of these, uh, but they will go fast. And so these are on all orders over $99 while supplies last over at equa.life. This is a $30 value. So head on over, grab your free bottle while supplies last at equi.life. Take care, everyone.